I finally finished Shin Megami Tensei 5. Finally. Finally I get to talk about this game. I was looking forward to this game ever since I started SMT3 back in May of 2021. And I was looking forward to it because it was a new release. Like, it was a brand new SMT game. So I was just curious to see if I was going to like it more or less than how I felt about SMT3. And usually with these newer releases or more modern releases of these games, they always try to be more accessible so that more people would play these games. So I was just curious to see where I was going to be with SMT5. You know, if you just look at Persona, like, I like Persona... I'm, I know I'm not the minority of people who like Persona 5, but I did like Persona 5 up probably a lot more than most, like, long-time Persona fans, I feel. And I... And I do like Persona 3 over Persona 5, but I do think Persona 5 is just, it's really up there for me in my favorite Persona games. So I was curious to see if I was going to feel the same way with SMT 5. Like, oh, maybe I'll like this game more than SMT 3 or equivalent or whatever, right? So let's get right into the gameplay of SMT 5. It has the same press turn system you'd expect from SMT, which is good. I love the press turn system, as I said with SMT 3's video. It really kind of made me turn on Persona a little bit because I think the press turn system is far more rewarding and satisfying than the combat of Persona where you get to string a long turn cycle if you're very clever with how you're doing weaknesses or criticals. Like, you can really turn the um, the uh, flow of battle very either easily or surprisingly, which can go both ways. The AI might be able to turn the battle against you just by a drop of the hat, etc., which I really enjoyed. I love the press turn system. And SMT5 is that same kind of system, obviously, which is great. The thing that it adds, however, is the Megatsuhi gauge, which I I liked it at the beginning of the game. I thought it was an in interesting mechanic, but the more I played SMT5, I kind of felt like that, that mechanic kind of breaks the game. It doesn't seem to be well balanced, especially with the other Megatsui skills that you get throughout the game. Like you could get like a massive damage attack, massive you could get a Megatsui gauge that makes all your skills like one MP or whatever. And the idea is nice, but you're never gonna stop using the uh, the critical one. There might be some Megatsui gauge skills that you might use, but you're always gonna default to the critical one because you get like eight turns just automatically pretty much. It does hurt a lot when you do the Megatsui gauge on critical and all that, and the enemy either misses, like you the enemy dodges your attack, or you land on a on a um an element that the enemy blocks. And it's just like God damn it. Like it makes that does hurt a lot, which I do like on that side of it. Like yeah, you, you get pretty much eight turns guaranteed, but when you land on a... If you do a skill that the enemy either nulls or that it misses, it does add a lot of pain because it could... That could change the flow just of what you were doing with that critical gauge. However, as I said before, it's that happens very seldomly, and it's like you're pretty much guaranteed almost to get eight turns out of out of it. So you're always going to use that specific skill over the others. And I think it just needs better balancing. And even that aside, like you get a um a miracle that eventually makes the Mega Tui gauge refill insanely fast to the point where using the gauge becomes trivial. It's like, okay, I used it. Well, I'm going to get it back within like a turn, a turn cycle pretty much. You could also gain Megatsui easily by blocking. You you get all these miracles that you that you get throughout the game, and miracles are a a pretty much like an upgrade uh, system. Pretty much, you just go through a menu. You you use uh, glory points to gain a miracle at the World of Shadows that can contribute either in skill affinities. It can attribute to cost of merchant supports or summoning or you could use that to to open more of your uh, slots be it attack or your demon compendium whatever whatever you, you could use the uh, glory to get all these little bonuses 
then also go into the Megatsui gauge, and you can really make that broken. Like, you can really make the Megatsui gauge pretty much fill up instantly. Uh, so, the Megatsui gauge is an interesting idea. It's just, it it really feels like you're, you're going to be playing this game and thinking in the back of your head, is this broken? This feels a little unbalanced because you start to see that there's some skills that just kind of, you can take advantage of, and it just it kind of undermines a, a lot of fights in some ways. I do like the idea, so I wouldn't say the answer would be to remove it. I just think there needs to be something more about that system that makes it a little more risk reward, kind of. But that's just me. I mean, maybe make more skills more advantageous. Uh, for the Mega 2 gauge than just the critical one because I really haven't used the other ones. The only one I used aside from the critical one is you get one that's called like Eternal Healing or something and it heals your entire demon stock and revives people with full health if they died, which is great. I do like that. I, I do like that skill. It's a good one if you're just on the brink of like, if, it, if an enemy just wipes half your party, you can just use that and you can kind of get your party back using that. So, so that was the only one I used that wasn't the critical one. Otherwise, I was mostly using the critical uh, Megatsui gauge skill. The other thing that they changed is the buff and debuffs. And a lot of people didn't like this because it felt more like Persona because each debuff and buff would last three turns. I The only thing I will say I liked about it is that it, it did kind of encourage you to layer your, your debuffs because let's say that... You layered your a buff for one, like you layered your party for like three turns with Sukunda, right? Or Sukukaja. You do that, and on the last turn, you see the icons flashing. If you do it again, it will stack it again. Like you, so you get like layered level two Sukukaja, which is good. So I do like in that in that idea of it where you could stack it and you could also continue it. Like it's not like oh you have to wait for it to run out or anything like that that said i do prefer the way that it was in smt3 where you just kind of get layer i've talked about how i use the debuffs and buffs in smt3 in the smt3 video i believe it, i just prefer that system more the other thing i i kind of i don't know i feel like I, like no one really has ever agreed with me on this or taught or even said anything about this but i feel like i'm going crazy with this the Suku, the Suku skills, the Suku Kaja Sukunda, I feel do nothing in this game. I really don't know why, because I in SMT3 when I did it, when I used Suku Kaja or Sukunda, it felt like it mattered. Like it felt like that, you know, hey, I did this thing, and it's actually affecting the uh, combat a little bit. Like it felt like I was actually doing something to the enemy and to my party. In SMT5. It really doesn't feel like it does anything. I I've been layer, I level I layered like two to three Sukunda on an enemy. The enemy still lands criticals, and the enemy still get uh, dodges a lot of attacks. And that's not to say I know there are skills that will um that some enemies have that will guarantee a critical. I know that, but this is, these are just straight up fucking moves. That they're doing. That they're getting criticals. Like, these are just normal moves. And they're just landing criticals like it's nothing. And I'm just like, what's the point? Like, for a lot of times, like, in SMT3, I felt more motivated to do Suku Sukunda and Sukukaja. In SMT5, it just felt like, why? Why should I do that? Like, I, I just... I, the, more and more, I was just questioning myself, like, why should I spend MP on this? Like, the uh, Rukunda and Ruku and uh, Rakukaja skills, like, those made sense because, like, those are just, hand like, those affect damage and damage input and damage output, which is, like, very straightforward. The Sukunda stuff is, like, that's more of an RNG kind of, kind of territory, but it's, like, it just doesn't seem like it does anything. And I feel like I'm just going crazy because I don't know why, I, in my whole playthrough, I would do this and they still land what they need to land, and it's, like, What's the point? I'm wasting MP on this at this point. So it, it was just kind of like frustrating to me that the Sukuna Tsukukaja skills really felt like that they had nothing to offer. Like it was to the point where I used to have a uh, Sukunda on my main character and I would just use that for bosses. I got rid of that skill in favor of other skills like 
Medidiran or uh, another elemental attack or whatever. And those were way more useful than the fucking Secunda, which is like, I, I shouldn't be feeling that, you know? So I I don't know the deal with Secunda and Sukukaja. I just didn't feel like it worked for me. I don't know why. It only started to feel like it worked when... Uh, I don't know. It, it, it just kind of felt like it just worked on a whim sometimes. I don't know. Like, it seemed later on in the game it started to make more of an impact than the beginning of the game. I don't know. I don't know. It is what it is. I, I felt like that is just a thing that I'm going crazy about, and maybe it's just me. I don't know. Maybe this is how I feel about it. I, I don't know. I can't really tell you. The other thing I will say that I did not like about this game, this game's combat that they changed, is that physical attacks will take MP. Which is fu- I don't get- I don't know why. Why do they make that change? It seems so dumb, because in SMT3, uh, you could do damage that takes HP. Even in Persona, by the way. You could do this in Persona as well, so it's Persona and, and SMT. And physical skills would take HP, which I thought was a good trade-off. Because, you know, yeah, you're not taking MP, but, you know, you're also- you are taking another meter. So it- it really benefits- a little bit more of a customization and variety in the gameplay. And SMT5 just, it seems like it takes that away. It's like, okay, no, everything is MP. And when I was going through the um, the skill upgrades, I was just saying, I was like, what's the point? The only thing I, I was really looking at at this point was just their stats and saying, what were they, what stats were higher? But I was doing that already because of SMT3. What SMT3 taught me and all that stuff, like just looking at the stats, what's higher, magic or strength, and base that on what skills you inherit, etc. But I just, I just wish that physical skills took HP. I can't stand, the whole playthrough, I was just saying, I was like, man, I really wish physical skills took HP. Like, I, I hated it for taking MP. The only thing I could, I could think that is probably what motivated Atlas to not having physical skills take uh, HP anymore is that you can now add any demon skills to other demons. Like, oh, this demon uh, is weak to to Zeo. I'm gonna find a demon that has null to Z null to electric, so that way it defends that weakness, etc. Like you could just mi- mix match skills with each demon. So I guess the idea would be that they wouldn't want you to have a demon that is known to be a physical demon, like, that's high strength and all that, you load that demon up with, like, MP, um, excuse me, HP healing, like, healing skills, support skills, etc. So that way, like, you know, you have, you have, something's being taken away, I guess. Which, it's fine, but at that point, like, then get rid of the skills then. Like, I feel like that the, the skill switching, if it takes away such a fundamental mechanic, there's no point. I I would rather trade the the uh, skill customization that that SMT five has for for that because I think it's more fun in the co- like like the skill customization is fun on like a customization level of the game and it's like oh it's really cool like you could actually like really make a custom demon so so it it, it is kind of fun adds a, a layer of depth that I do like it's just I tend more to be I tend to like more the the versatility of what you could do in battle. And I, I just think that taking away physical skills, taking, taking HP, just removes a layer of, of fun that I had in the combat from other from other pre- previous games. Uh, so that's that's another major bummer with the combat. Uh, I do like the, the uh, that drain null takes a turn cycle away, etc. You could also gain a skill that's called safeguard. Safeguard is an amazing skill. I, I once I saw that skill, I was like, I'm putting in almost all my demons because it makes guessing the elemental weakness of of enemies far more uh, safe because you don't have to lose two turns for a wrong guess. So I do like that you could get that skill very easily. It's a great skill. Love that skill. Uh, so it that that level of it is really fun. I do like some of the new skills that they that they have in the game. I do like that you could really mix mix and match custom skills, etc. I as I said, it's just really the HP thing is just kind of a bummer to me. Uh so let's talk about the World of Shadows, which is this game's version of the Cathedral of Shadows. 
I I liked a lot of what they did with the World of Shadows. It really made that whole sec the whole room far more useful and thought and thoughtful than the World of Shadows. The World of Shadows, not, excuse me, the Cathedral of Shadows, only was just about fusing demons. So that's all the importance it had. So that so it's great for those games. But this seemed more far more like I found myself really digging all of the options I could do with my party. It's like okay. What essences do I have? What should I mix and match? Okay, what what weakness do I have? And I've been trying to find the best ailments, the best skills that I mean, excuse me, best affinities and best skills to mix and match, etc. So I really enjoyed that side of it. I also like the compa- the um, fusing way more in this game. It makes it the 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 fusions in this game kind of go between. Does it make fusing too easy, or does it make, or is it like fair? Because you could do reverse compendium fusion, which does this every single demon you could just fuse off the bat, and I do like that a lot because it kind of gives you a bigger uh, perspective of what you can make, ra- rather than okay, I have to go to my compendium, I have to buy a demon to get out of the compendium to see what I can fuse with, which was kind of a nuisance in. SMT3, like, I kind of had a hard time really motivating myself to do that. So, it was nice in SMT5, where you get a bigger picture of what you could fuse. So, that's why that is a little more, like, I feel that the uh, reverse compendium fusion, I'm, I'm, I'm mixed on. Like, I like the idea that I could just look at all these, de- at all the demons I could fuse, just right there. But it also just kind of makes fusing a little bit too easy I guess but I think it's I think overall it's a fine decision because it just makes you more uh keen on what you could fuse and even though it's it gives you a big list that doesn't mean that's all the demons in the game like there's still demons you can unlock by getting more and more demons throughout the game which is which is nice I do like that there's some still some demons that are hidden behind uh you trying to find the right the right uh, demon makes to get a certain demon, etc. There's also special fusions, which can give you very good demons, like Be- uh, Beelzebub. Um, you could get, like, um, uh, Zeus, Artemis, Artemis? No, Artemis is DLC. Whatever. So, I do like all, like, you know, the fusions in that's pretty nice. The Miracles, which is what I said earlier, where you're taking glory points and putting into either uh, affinity bonuses, like, you could get, like, uh, plus nine in Agadine, or, like, Aggie skills and fire skills, you get plus nine, so that means it's, like, nine points below the required, uh, like, let's say that Agadine or Aggie is, like, not, like, 10 MP, you get, like, plus nine, and that'll be, like, okay, one, one MP to use it, which is nice, it's a nice, like, thing you could always go back to and really include what really improve what you could use and it carries over regardless it's a nice system i love i love going through that menu and really finding the best miracles to really hone in on the one thing about the miracles that is kind of a bummer is that when you start the game the demons you get and you and uh, the main character themselves have a certain amount of skills that they can hold so it might start off with like four i think and the more miracles you get, you start to see, you start to see these miracles called like the demon, uh, demon proficiency and divine proficiency, and the demon proficiency unlocks more skill slots, and same with the divine proficiency, it la- opens more skill slots for the main character. This I I hate I hated this because you're gonna go through this game and you're gonna get all these skills and you're like all these skills are amazing I want all these skills and you realize you have no room in your in your um skill slots you have to keep unlocking more miracles and you don't get the full skill slots open until the very end of the game and I kind of get why kind of in the sense of progression but I kind of feel that like this is a very needed upgrade that it should be really unlocked early on in the game I think it getting the full uh, skill slots open at the very end is kind of silly. I guess on one hand, you could sit there and say, well, it's to encourage New Game Plus, maybe. Maybe New Game Plus, you'll get all these skill slots to carry over and whatever. But I I still feel that getting the full skill slots should be earlier on in the game, not just at the very end. Um, 
So that was kind of a bummer. It's not a huge... I, I wouldn't say, like, I, I've seen people say that so that's a big deal. I don't think it's a big downgrade in the game. It's just it's just a bummer that you can't that you can't get the full skill slots until the very end of the game. And that's kind of that's kind of a bummer. Like it, it would have worked fine if it was a little bit early on in the game. But it is it is what it is. Uh The other thing that this game does is it adds a lot more direct side quests. I feel that there there have always been side quests in SMT3 at least. But these were a little more subdued in the background. Like, these are things that you could easily miss. Well, in SMT5, they're a little more uh, scattered out. And they have a little more of, like, a, their own little mini-stories in it. And I like these side quests. However, there's just some that they're just really dull. Like, there's one that's like, okay, get, like, ten I Inagami heads. And you just have to kill, like, ten Inagamis. And it's like... Okay... The ones I really loved, and I wish there were more of, was the ones that you could pick between two demons, pretty much. Like, there was one that I really loved. I I, I always, I'll always talk about this one. There's one where you could pick either to side with Black Frost or Dionysus. And let's say that you want to side with Black Frost. Black Frost will tell you, hey, I'm trying to run a business or whatever the fuck, and Dionysus is, is uh, taking all the wine from me. We should kill that guy. I want, I want the wine, and this guy is, like, hoarding all the wine. Such fucking bullshit. I'm like, yeah, Black Frost, that is bullshit. I'm gonna fucking deal with this. I go to meet Dionysus, and Dionysus is like, hey, man, you want some wine? I'll give it to you, but, like, that Black Frost guy, he's no good. He's bad news. You should kill him. It's like, nah, fuck you. I'm gonna kill you for Black Frost. He's cooler. Then I, then I kill Dionysus, and Black Frost joins my party. It was fucking rad. An amazing plot twist. So cool. And I like that. I like those side quests. There was one early on in the game with Asperis and um, Liana, which I really liked. And that one, I didn't, I didn't really like know you could do the other way around. I thought once you start the quest line with Asperis, you're just forced to fight Liana regardless. But then you go to Liana and you talk to her. She's like, she gives you the opportunity to betray uh, Asparagus, pretty much. And. I like that. I like that a lot, and I wish there were more of those quests. There were, like, only, what, two? Two quests that did that? Maybe three. And that that was it. I love that quest, those kind of quests, and there weren't as many of them. The other one I liked was in uh, the final open world area. There's one where you meet uh, uh, Malkovic, or whatever this, this dude's name is. The guy with, like, the golden helmet, purple body. You talk to him, and he's like, you need to fight these angels. Fuck them. It's like, all right, you fight, like, Gabriel, Raphael, and all that shit. You beat them up, and then you get them as special fusions as well. And those are really good missions. I really love those missions. And it's such a shame there weren't a lot of them. There's also some that that does tie into getting the true end, which I didn't know until, like, I looked it up, because uh, I'll tell you right now, I did not get the true ending of SMT5, unfortunately. I... I fucked it up because I didn't know the game had because the missions that matter for the for the uh, true ending really at, at a surface level have no bearing on anything like the way you start this quest line you have to talk to Isis she tells you oh you gotta beat up this other demon because she because this demon's causing a, causing a mess or whatever the fuck so you fight that then Isis is happy Isis goes back home or whatever the fuck then you fight Kansu. And I didn't know you had to spare him. I read one guy that said, it doesn't matter. You could, you could either kill him or spare him. It doesn't matter. It's all good. I killed him. And it, it, it did matter. Which is like fucking bullshit. Why did the guy lie to me, dude? So I screwed myself out of the true ending. I even fought Sheva, which you're supposed to do. Did all that bullshit for nothing. Except I was able to fuse Sheva. That was the only positive, I guess. It's just, it's such, it's so lame to me that the way to get the true ending is hidden behind a, a um a side quest that has no importance on anything. It it starts off so innocently, and then by the time you get to the part where the other the other quest would open, if you don't spare Kanto, you'll never get it. So you have to spare him. It's like why isn't there a, a clearer like connection with these with that side quest? I don't know. But that was that was a bummer there. 
that said, I still like the side quest. I still like that this game had more of a, of a direct side quest with it. The ones I also really liked was one with Demeter, where you're just fighting Ball. You're fighting all these other big demons. The the um the Four Lords is also one of them I really like doing as well. So the side quests are nice and adds a little bit more of like a lively aspect to the open world. And this is another thing I do want to bring up is the open world. I feel that SMT5 does something that all these other games have been trying to do lately and feel that SMT5 did it and succeeded. So if you look at games like Breath of the Wild, No More Heroes 3, and um, there was one more game. I can't think of it now. But, anyways, you look at Breath of the Wild, you look at No More Heroes 3, you have these big, vast, open world environments, but the dungeons that you that you, that the game gives you are dull. They're just the same kind of idea, copy-pasted. No More Heroes 3 has a nice, like, aesthetic with the open world, but they're, but they're empty, etc. And when you do these little missions in the story of a No More Heroes 3, it gives you into, like, a vague open room to fight enemies. So it's, it's so... Both these games have their own drawbacks with the open world. It's like a weird trade-off in those games. Meanwhile, with SMT5, the open world seem expansive and more characteristic. They're much more interesting, and they just and the open worlds themselves are pretty much the um the dungeons of SMT. You do get like two or three traditional dungeon-like areas in in SMT5, but uh for the most part you're just going to be stuck in this open world and doing all this exploration and hidden areas and all this kind of stuff. And it really gives you a good incentive to really look around each environment for a me-man, a glory crystal, uh, or even just demons that are just roaming around that you want to just capture. It's really, it's a really nice aspect to the game that adds a lot of liveliness to the open world. The only downside with it, that I kind of, that it, it's more on the story that I have an issue with the, with just how the atmosphere is, mostly, which I'll get into the story segment of, of this video. But I do like that the open world is more characteristic. When I first played SMT5, I was very, very nervous to, to praise the open world of it because I was just playing the game thinking, man, I really hope that this game isn't just, hey, you're in a desert, there you go, and that's all you're in. And I was just very nervous. That's It was just going to be the same kind of scenery. But then the more I played it, I actually liked how each area is a very different feel to it. Like, there's, it's not... They don't feel like palette swaps as much. I think the only one that might feel vaguely like a palette swap... I can't remember the name of this place, but it's like purple. It's like purple-pink. Uh, I think it's... I think it's the area before you go to Ginza. If any... If you guys know what I mean, so so that that part of the game is the only one that's kind of samey to uh, the first area, but it's still a little different on its own way. In its own way, so I do like the open world in SMT Five. It seems more thought out and seems more like, hey, you're just gonna be playing around in this big open world, have fun. And there's no areas that just feel like arbitrary invisible walls. There's like a few, like maybe one or two places that I could think of on the top of my head that you go there and it's just you can't continue. But it's like, you know, a small little, little area. Uh, so overall, I love the open world. I love the overworld. I love going, doing all that stuff. The only thing that this game does, and this also ties in a little bit to the story, but... You, there are moments in this game where you go to, to a high school, pretty much. You go between the high school and the apocalyptic world of, of um, the, nev the nether world or whatever the fuck. And th these, these school segments are very short and they're, like, very minimal. But I think the game would have, just have done better without that. The high school parts really felt like it was Alice trying to trick Persona fans into playing SMT. That's really what it felt like. Because it felt like the Alice just knew that Persona 5 gave them all these eyes that, that would never be on their games before. And they're like, okay, well, we're doing SMT5. We got to have a school segment a little bit just to trick them. It, it just feels like bait. They make these people think, oh my god, SMT5 is like Persona. And then they play it and they're like, oh man, there's no, it doesn't have the heart of Persona. And then that was it. Like... I think that's, and I honestly do think that's probably why you've seen a lot of meme reviews that compare to Persona so much. It's because 
the game, I feel, innately tricked a lot of Persona fans or Persona 5 fans into playing SMT and they didn't know what they were getting into, which is really silly, especially that the SMT3 remaster came out like earlier this uh, that year, but whatever, it is what it is. Uh, it just feels like SMT5 just did a lot of things that were just kind of there just to trick Persona fans into playing, Persona 5 fans into playing SMT5, <laughs> pretty much. It's just, it just detracted from from the flow of the world, and it just, I just didn't, it didn't serve anything for me. It's like, this this can go away. Like, they have the same, like, uh, when you go to the high school area, it gives you the same kind of overworld as SMT3 has when you're doing the Vortex World stuff, and just that little cursor going around the map. And it just felt like that they just put it there because it's like, well, SMT fans are going to love this, but we can't have the whole game be like this because no one would like it. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, I get it, but you could also just not have this segment of the game. Like, the high school really just felt like that it was just there just to be there. I, I, didn't, I didn't care for it. It just detracted from, from the areas I loved. So, it's, it's whatever. The, the music. I will say, I, I still love SMT3's music a lot more. I, I still think it's like the peak of SMT music that I've listened to. So, I mean, I can't speak for 4, 2, or 1, or whatever the fuck, but between 3 and 5, I still think 3 is a far better soundtrack. I love that boss theme. It's so good. I just, I keep thinking about that boss theme. I'm just like, man, I could listen to that for 10 hours. The music in SMT5 is good, but I can't say a lot of the tracks are memorable. The ones I really did not like at all were when you get a, 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 a Mitama, Nigi Mitama or whatever, any of the any of the uh, Mitamas, I hate that fucking music. Every time I hear it, it just I hate it. I it just pisses me off. Every time I hear it, it's like, it's like oh my god, I just want sh- fuck off. I hate that fucking beat. It's so fucking annoying. I don't I don't really have a realistic reason why I don't like that song. I just don't like it. Uh, the battle theme, I. I like I like the idea that they were going for like you start a battle and it's like and it's like very quiet and then the second you you select a uh, attack it's like dun, 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 and it gets like very intense and all that I do I do like that I do like the idea with that however it is kind of silly well no actually no no I like that too actually I was thinking because when you do a negotiation with the demon uh it also goes to another another song, which is also pretty good. I like the talk the talk song as well, and then if that goes south. Like it makes that, and it does like another like battle theme, which is really cool. I really I really like the idea that they what they were going for with it. It's just it it kind of just is there. I don't I don't know. Like it's not as good as the battle themes as I was hearing listening to in SMT three. The other thing that that is taken away is. The, uh, the force battles. So, th- there's no really force battle music. There's, there is different, like, there's a form of force battles in this game, which is more, um, I, I don't know. Well, I guess w- what it would be, would be these titan enemies. As you're going through each map, you'll see this giant enemy that is walking through the map. And those have their own theme to them, which is which is good. I do like that those enemies get their own exclusive like boss theme, which is nice. And that's another thing I do like about this game is that you get to see demons running around the world. For some reason, I don't know if anyone else feels this way. When I was in the fairy village, and I saw the Nekamatas just running around, I thought that was the cutest shit. I I don't know why. I guess it's because they're like cats, they're like cat people, and it's like just cute to see they're just running around like cats, pretty much. I. I, and that's all I could say about that. The other thing I liked was the seeing there's like a, a little warehouse full, full of Jack Frost. And I thought that was really cool. I was like, oh, hell yeah. Look at these Jack Frost fuckers fucking running around and shit. It was really cool. I do like that depending on what level you are, it, it uh changes how they act. So if you're going in over leveled, they all run from you. If you're under leveled, they chase you. The only de- The only demons that don't do that are the ones that fly. And some of them are I, I could deal with, but there's a lot of flying enemies that is just like, man, I wish they would just leave me the fuck alone. And it's the it's the Garu the Anzus, yeah, the Anzu, the fucking flying lion bullshit. Those demons are so fucking annoying. I hate them. I like they were so annoying. Every time I play SMT five and I, I see those fuckers flying around, it's like, 
I, I, I don't want to deal with this right now. I just, I just want to go to this fucking fiend fight, damn it. And these fucking a Anzu assholes are flying around. So, I don't like that the flying demons don't really affect the, uh, don't really interact with what level you are. So, that's bullshit. But yeah, I like the Nekamon is running around. I, I really, that's really it. Pretty cool, huh? Uh, but the music is overall solid. The one music I really liked was there's a side quest you do where you fight King Frost. That song is my favorite. I love that track. It's so fucking relaxing and intense at the same time. It's a great track. It's like a guitar. It's, a, it's so fucking good. I was, like, I was singing it just, like, kind of humming it. Like, that's, oh, man, it was so, it was such a good beat. But overall, the soundtrack is, it's, it's good. It's good for what I was expecting. I was kind of con worried that the soundtrack was, it's going to be, like, lackluster or bland. And I won't say it's bland. I don't think it's a bland soundtrack, but it's just not as good as 3. I think I, I just enjoy 3's aesthetic way more than 5. 5 is good for what it is, but I think 3's is just far better. The visuals of SMT5, they look nice for a Switch game. Like, they look very, like, they look pretty. They have a nice, like, design. I do like some of the character designs, like the main character. Everyone loved the design of the main character and all that shit. I love some of the demon redesigns. Like, I was kind of critical about Angel's design. It's like, I, I I like the original Angel design. I thought that was way cooler. But as I was playing SMT5, it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, I get why they, they redesigned Angel the way that they did. It's to fit the tone of the story. It would be very goofy for the original design of the, of the Angel to be in the story. It would just be kind of like, okay. Though, though, I would give him a lot of props though it'd be it, it would be just like yeah just own the fucking corny weirdness of the fucking angel design at that point that'd be kind of cool but i do get why they 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 opted for the more traditional kind of imagery for the angel so it's it's whatever that's whatever however though i'd still i still prefer the aesthetic and the visuals of smt5 i i mentioned this in the in the smt3 video I just like that it really felt like a Suda 51 game. I love that these characters have these very, like, I love the art style. I love that cell shaded and all this stuff. I really loved that that style to it. In SMT5, it doesn't, it it feels like Guilty Gear, what Guilty Gear Strive did to Guilty Gear Exard. Exard is this very expressive anime style, and each character has a very stylistic intro and outro. And all this, like, flair added to the game. And then Strive comes out, and Strive is a very gorgeous game, but it, it takes away a lot of the expressiveness and personality that Exard had in it. Exard really just had all this like raw energy pumped into it, and Strive is like, all right, here's a here's like a a sterile, normy shit kind of style to it, which is which is good, whatever. But I, you know, I if you talk to a lot of Guilty Gear fans, I feel that like they all like pick Exard style over Strive. And that's how I feel about SMT5 versus 3. 3 has a lot of personality and style to it, and 5 just feels like it just takes that out, and it's like, well, people like realistic-looking anime shit, and that's really what it is. It's not... And as I said, it's not a bad-looking game. It's just... I like the expressive style that SMT3 had. Like, you see Demi Fiend punch an enemy, and it's so fucking expressive, and it has that meaty punch that you just feel this big like impact on and this like the Nahobino has like a sword so it's like yeah you're not getting that same kind of hit when you're landing landing an attack so it just doesn't have that same kind of expressive feel to it that smt3 has so, uh, it's just not it's not an ugly game but it's just it takes away a lot of what i liked about smt3 and that's probably because it was probably going for more of an angelic Bi Bible like, biblic, is biblic a thing? Kind of, kind of style. So I, I can't say I love SMT Five style because it kind of runs the same issue I have with the story, which I'll get into very soon. So you know, I overall the visuals are are solid. The frame rate does dip here and there because it's on on the Switch. I know what a, what a fucking shocker, but. I can't say it was that bad. I played I played fucking Hyrule Warriors. So yeah, yeah. I played Hyrule Warriors. I, I've seen I've seen some shit. 
about the story of SMT5? Well, let's talk about it. I will get into spoilers, so if you haven't played the game yet, check it out, play the game, come back, and listen to my opinion on the story of SMT5. So let's get into it, you've been warned, here we go. I will say this story is slightly... It's just serviceable. And it's kind of a bummer, after playing SMT3, I really enjoyed what that story had to offer. It was very fun to see the true demon ending and the world around it and all this stuff going on. While 5, it starts off pretty well, it's kind of interesting. But once you get to the died building and after that, that's kind of when I started to really get concerned about my opinion on the story. Because when it started, I really liked the idea that, oh, you were once in this nice little city and then in a blink of an eye, suddenly Tokyo got destroyed. You don't know why. You see all these demons around and it really lets you think or just run wild with your own thoughts as to like what could have happened and all this kind of stuff. I love that it just drops you in into an apocalyptic world while SMT3 took the time to kind of develop the world before it was set to um, to be destroyed and all that kind of stuff. So playing five and seeing how quickly it drops you in, I was like, wow, this is actually like really interesting. I really want to know what's the story here. What happened? And really after the died building, that's when I started to just be like, I, I don't know if I like the story <laughs> because I did not like that it becomes a plot point that, oh, well, uh, there's actually like, God made this fake Tokyo to house humanity, and outside is, like, the real world and has all these demons and fucked up shit, so, and that's gonna go away eventually as well, etc. And I just did not like that that nice little re Tokyo you're in is still around, and you're just going through a portal. I just don't, I don't like that. It just seemed, that to me just felt like it, it, as I said before, it felt like that they made it this way so that they would just trick Persona 5 fans into playing an SMT game. That's really what it felt like, and the story kind of reflects that. Because it, 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 I feel it needlessly brings you back to the school for, like, menial reasons. Like, oh, Lamu's trying to find his human counterpart, so gotta go back to school. It's like, no, can we just not do this? Can we just do something else? Like, SMT3 did a better job of dropping all these characters into an apocalyptic Tokyo. You see these these students interact with demons in their own way, and they all react to the world differently. And that was far more interesting, to see how they would react to the world. Here, it just... It, it's not them reacting to the world. It's not them reacting to the, the fact that that demons exist or anything. It was just... Wow, humanity got, got destroyed, and this happened... We gotta, we gotta pick our sides. It's like, it, it just did not feel at all as interesting or compelling as SMT3 story, where it seemed more and more like, depending on what alignment you picked, it kind of felt like a reflection of just how you, 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 you felt about the story and the game. Like in SMT3, you could really pick to align with no one because you're, you're gonna sit there and say, wow, these guys are fucking assholes. They're all like backstabbing each other. They're all, like, monsters now. Fuck them. And they just do away with them or whatever. And that's why I like the demon ending a lot. It was actually more like... It, it felt like you were mad at God for what what he allowed to happen, pretty much. And you're just like, yeah, you know, God did this. Fuck them. And then you just fight Lucifer to prove yourself and all that. And SMT5, it just really doesn't feel like anything. It just feels like all these events just kind of, like... It forms them to be in alignment kind of thing like most smt games but it's just not interesting and the development between these characters is awful like i i think more and more about the fucking character trailer that they did they did a whole trailer to announce the english voice cast and i can't help but laugh at that trailer now because they that trailer needlessly emphasized characters that had one scene pretty much atatsu's fucking sister has the most minimal presence in the whole game. <laughs> and the the trailer was like, oh, this, vo this voice actress voices her. Look at that. Oh, it's like, cool. Is she going to do anything? No. They, they do try to make her seem like she has a point, but she doesn't. It's like, 
I think the, uh, the what they try to pass off is, oh, she's going to nurture the, the students that were left behind or whatever from, like, the world disappearing or whatever the, whatever the fuck. And it's like, yeah, okay, but it doesn't do anything. It doesn't go anywhere with her with that, which is really, like, a bummer. Like, it's, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, like, SMT3 has a similar issue I said in my last video where you don't really do a decent, they, they do a, an okay job developing uh, Noah. Uh, I'm just going to go by the characters I named them after, like Yukari, Mitsuru, uh, Stormlit. Like, they, they're decently developed to be what they need to be. Like, yeah, they, they, you know, they're not well developed, but they're developed enough where you, you can feel one way or the other but each one. In SMT5, they don't do anything with these characters. Like, the most you get is Dazai. And he I hate Dazai. He's a fucking shitty character. His whole character arc is... I suck. I want to be good. I want to be a good person. I want to I wanna, I wanna fight. I want to do shit. And then, like, by the end of the game, All right, I'm ready to do shit. Yeah, let, let's, let's fuck Abdiel. Like, that's pretty much all, it, all he did in that game was just simp hard on Abdiel. He pretty much wanted to fuck her pretty, at, at that point. The whole point of his character is pretty much he wants to get in bed with Abdiel, which is like... Okay, but why? Like, it, he kind of forsakens humanity with what he's doing and, because he, he aligns with Bethel, but why? Why does he want to align with fucking Abdiel so badly? Um, Atats, but he... But even then, I, I get that he has some development, so you do see that he does have an arc, to a point. Though I do think he just, he, he does kind of goes too far by the end. It's just kind of silly where he ends up. But he gets more of a development than anyone else. Atatsu, like, he's just there. He's just like a, he's a fucking drone. Uh, uh, the other guy, I can't remember his name, the uh, Aogami's brother... He could pretty much tell Atatsu to jump off a bridge and he'd, he'd say yes, pretty much. He's he's nothing. He's not interesting. He has he offers nothing. The whole time he's just like, we gotta defend Tokyo. Yeah. Yeah. But, like, wh why do you agree with Aogami's brother? Why does he agree with all these gods forming? Like, like the only thing I will say I like about Dazai that he does highlight that gods will innately fight each other. So, why is that a better alternative? I do like that that thing that he calls them out for, but Atatsu doesn't really acknowledge the criticism. He's just like, ah, shut up. He wants to do it. I do what he says, pretty much. The other character I do like, um, at least at least had a little bit more development is um, Yakimo. I like Yakimo uh, in the sense that like I I feel that out of all of them, I kind of liked a little bit what he wanted. He just wanted a world where it's for humans, for humanity, and he wanted humanity to survive on their own strength. Now, I don't agree all the way the way he said, because he wants to purge the weak, pretty much. Don't really agree with that part of it, but I like the idea that he's like, these demons fucking suck, they care for themselves, fuck them. Humans can do much more than, than, what, the, than what these demons can do, fuck that, right? And I like that idea of it, I like that perspective. Of his ideology, I just don't agree all the way with what he wanted to do with it, with his vision of the world, and it, and that's kind of where I felt is kind of the shortcoming. I felt with SMT three, maybe you could argue Yukari's ideology is is kind of a is a redundant one and it's just dumb. Okay, but the others were at least a little more interesting, like Mitsuru's, which is kind of a neutral like non non ideology kind of thing but that was at least interesting in its own way where it's like she you're dealing with a character that doesn't know what she wants but she knows she know she has an idea of what she wants so she doesn't know how to get it which is like an interesting co uh, complex to have and to develop develop on this game has none of this inter interesting plot lines with these characters i didn't care for dazai by the time that that you pick the ideology it's like I don't really give a shit about these about the about all of this. I kind of like, like I kind of at first with a Tato, I'll admit I did not really get why that was the chaotic side uh, a chaotic um alignment. But then I realized, oh wait, no, because there's gonna be all these gods and all gonna fight. So of course that's chaos in of itself. But then how would Yakumo's not be chaos either? Like there's I feel there's two chaos chaos routes in this and one law which is 
Abdiel and Dazai, and why would you side with them? Fuck them. Uh, so I, I just feel like the story just seems very weak. And then to get to the the true ending, now this I, I did end up going through YouTube to watch the true ending because. I, I will say I have no desire right now to just to play replay the whole game again to get what I need to get to get the true ending. Uh, it's just I I'm I have no desire to do that right now. So I watched the true ending and and all that, and I gotta say that even that ending is kind of a bummer. Like I I I think it does a better job giving a finality to the story and it gives you a little more of a um like a, a feeling of fin a finality pretty much. Like it does a good job with that. Like it gives you, it gives you like a farewell with Algami. It tells you that you're just going to be, uh, you know, recreating the world, that you're going to watch the world until it gets destroyed inevitably. Which I liked. I liked what that ending had to, had to offer, but I kind of just, after watching, I was like, okay, yeah, I don't really care for, to do it at this point. Like, if I do it, I'll just, I'm going to be streaming the game on hard, and then we'll do it from there, right? But it just seems kind of like, okay. Like, I feel like with SMT3, some of the endings seem a little more, like, they they leave something there, but I I just think SMT three has a better ending. The true demon ending just had a much more impactful ending. Where yeah, you beat Lucifer, now fight God. It's like holy shit! Like you you did all this stuff, and now you're gonna uh, go after God. And this one it just ends with like yeah, you, you did the thing, and then you just wipe your hands clean and you just go to sleep. Pretty much, it's it's not a bad ending, all in all. But I just feel the whole journey to get there it just is weak and. The worst part of the story is the middle. It it meanders so bad. Like, after the diet building, the story just kind of goes at a snail's pace. And then when you go to the part where you have all these meetings with these other branches, like with Zeus, um, uh, Kansu, uh, um, is it Vizaki? The, uh, snake guy, uh, there, there, there's a few I keep forgetting. Oh, Odin? Uh, like, you talk to these characters, these, these other, uh, branches, and that part of the story, it's like, that's, that's kind of interesting, because you're, you're seeing that the, uh, the Japan branch is gonna betray all these other branches and just destroy all that stuff, which I kind of like, but it also doesn't, it, it just feels like that, that, that should have happened early on in the game. By the time that happens, the game is about to wrap up, and it's like, okay... And uh, it just doesn't have that much of an impact. Like, it really made me wonder just why the beginning is so meandering. Like, it kind of I kind of wish that this was the beginning. Like, I think it would have been more impactful if, like, the game starts, you go to the dive building, uh, and then Al and then Algami's brother sees you, and he's just like, hey, you're an Ahubino. Okay, great. Let's go to the fucking branches. Let's show you off. Then they're like, hey, you, you created an Ahubino? That's fucked up. Okay, fuck that. And they all... Splinter off after that. That would have been a much more interesting way to start the whole game and and all that, like to get things moving. The fact it and it happens like near the end of the game, it's like, wh why? Why do they design the story this way? It just seems kind of ludicrous that the beginning is so like interesting, and then it just meanders, and then this other part that could have been interesting, it just is is by the end and everything just seems wrapped and I, and I saw a tweet from someone and I agreed with it where this guy was saying that the story just feels like uh it's just that it had a lot of cut content and this will just be repackaged in a re-release and I kind of think that's what's going to happen it really does feel like that we're going to get a re-release of SMT5 that's going to come out on PS4 PC whatever and it's going to have more content in it and I feel like that's what we're going to get at some point in the future and I kind of don't really like that, that the game feels that way. And it's so easy to believe that, especially when this game had so much day one DLC. that, And the only day one DLC I thought was worth it was the Demi Fiend DLC. And even that, like, I tried that boss fight. I did one, I tried it the first time as a joke because I knew I was going to get wiped out immediately. I was like level 80 something. So I was like, yeah, I know I'm going to die very quickly. Die very quickly. Try it again. And I it just at that point I was like, I I could probably maybe win if I really tried, but I just sat there I was like, why why? Like, I feel like the Demi Fiend DLC should have a more of a of a story presence. I I kinda don't know if it even has a has a uh, ending cutscene. 
uh, I try to find it on YouTube and I just can I can find it, but I kind of wish the Demi Fiend DLC had as much of a of a reason to play it as like the Maniacs stuff for SMT three, like doing the whole thing with the uh, Temple of Amala. Oh, not Temple of Amala, Amala Network. No, oh my God, the Amala Labyrinth. And going through all these, the menorahs and all that stuff, like, that amounted to something that gave you a good ending. And I just wish that that was the case for the Demi Fiend DLC in SMT5. Because that was interesting to see the uh, de the uh, Demi, the, um, the Demi Fiend, well, it was interesting to see him again. But the Fiends, and you talk to the Matador, and they keep telling you, like, oh, man, you're gonna go against the guy? The, uh, the guy? <sighs> Good luck, man. He's fucking badass. Like, I like that because it kind of gave a, a, um, a more of a significance to what happened in SMT3 where, yeah, Demi Fiend beat them all up and they were all just like, they all sided with him at that point. And then here it's like, yeah, I and I, I liked Mother Harlot a lot in SMT5 where she was like, I am tired of being people's pawns, you know? Yeah, I, I, like, Demi Fiend fucking sucks, but I'm just gonna... I, that doesn't mean I'm not gonna fucking kick your ass. Like I, so I liked a lot of the characterizations of the fiends in SMT Five. It just I don't know how it ends. Uh, to see if that amounts to anything. But there's it doesn't give you an ending. If it gives you a fifth ending, that'd be very cool. But it doesn't. Uh, I will say that they do give you a Lucifer fight. I I will say, I like Lucifer's design, but I prefer Lucifer in SMT Three. He just, in SMT3, he was a giant enemy. He was fucking huge. And he was, like, towering. And I was like, oh, oh, shit, this is a fucking final battle. In SMT5, it's just, he's not the same. It's like, and then when he's like, this is my true form, it's like, that's that's your true form? Like, you look cooler in SMT3. You look like a bitch here. Like, not much of a bitch, but it just doesn't, it just doesn't have the same impact as he did in SMT3. I was like, I looked at that, I was like, this is what, this is what you look like? Fucking, really? <laughs> yeah, Yabalabov, whatever the fuck, from Persona 5 is much more threatening than this guy. And that, that's, that was kind of a bummer. I, I, I felt bad for Lucifer that he looked like that. And I don't even think he has half the moves he had in SMT three either i i watched a fight with him and he didn't have the fucking king's deck or whatever which i thought was a cool fucking move and he didn't have that so it, it just seems like that this had a lot of good ideas that didn't go anywhere and it was just it was just kind of a bummer i was really hoping that it was that maybe the ending was gonna change my mind the ending i got was i decided to destroy the throne and that ending was it was all right. I I just have a feeling that I wasn't gonna like any of the other endings, because the way I I think that each ending is gonna go is this, it depends on the narration is what matters. I feel like the narrator will say something different for each one, and at the end, depending on who you align with, is gonna be the one where you nod your head to pretty much. Like so when I picked the destroy the throne ending, I went to this like screen and you saw Yakuma and Nuwa, and you just like are there and like this, and then. You hear the narration say, well, then the humans did this and that happened. And it's like, okay, that that's it. So I do think the true ending is a little bit better in the sense that it gives you a better ending. And it gives you, it's a better presentation of it. But it, it just feels the other endings, I feel it's, it's going to play out the same way as the one I got. And that's kind of a bummer. Uh, so... The story is solid. I, I can't say I despise the story, but... I will say playing SMT three, even during playing SMT five, it didn't do SM it didn't do five any favors. I do kind of wonder my opinion would have been if I played SMT five first, but I am grateful that I played three first. I think three is a way better game, and I like the story way more. Five is solid, but that story is is really disappointing. It has all it has everything that makes it interesting and, uh promising but it's sally doesn't do much for for what's there the characters don't feel that interesting the characters feel kind of kind of bland and i can't really remember half the stuff that happened to some of these characters it, it just is it's just weak the fact that when you pick your your alignment you you still don't feel like you have a good grasp of their of their uh of what they're about 
And this goes back to what I said earlier, how this affects the world design and the atmosphere. In SMT3, as you're going about the story and you're going to each area, you get more of an idea of what each ideology is because it molds the town you're in. Like, you talk to the mannequins, you understand what they're about, and then you see Yukari come in and fucking annihilate them. And that is to tell you what Yukari's ideology is all about. You go to the Amala Temple, and that gives you a very clear picture of what Stormlit is about. You go to uh, Hikawa's section of the game, and you understand what he's about. Like, each area you go to, the world is molded by that ideology, so that gives you, like, a taste of what each ideology is. And every time you talk to these characters, they tell you what they're about. And they even ask you if you want to join them during certain parts of the game. In SMT5, you don't get any of that. The only one you get is with Abiel and Dazai, because that's that molds a majority of the game. Half the game, you're seeing Bethel's will, pretty much. You're being told what Bethel's all about, what Abiel's fighting for, and all this stuff. So when the game is like, well, what about a a Atasuta and Yakumo? It's like, yeah, I, I know about them, but what's really there? I don't, it's just, you, you, you're just told what you're told, pretty much. That's all you have to go for. But you spend all this time with Bethel and all in that organization that it's like, you have a very good understanding of what Dazai and Abiel are fighting for. And it's just like, it doesn't really paint a fair fight for or a fair picture for these other um, alignments, which is funny to me because in SMT3, I was hearing that they intentionally underdeveloped a lot of the characters so that you would be able to pick an alignment without any bias. Well, here, it's like they seem to overdevelop Abdiel and Bethel way too much to the point where you have more of, an, of a reason to side with them than anyone else. I, I think the second most uh, alignment that you'd probably go with would be um, Atasuta because you at least get an idea why they why they are against Bethel anyway. They tell you like when um, before the summit, the guy tells you straight up like, "Yeah, I want to go against Bethel because they fucking suck ass. They don't they don't want to defend Tokyo at all. You know they let this happen, and we're gonna and if we stop them." We can defend it the way we want to, and we don't have to answer to these fucking assholes. And it's like, okay, I get that, but that's all you have going for. And then we look at the suit as like the mascot for it. It's like, who, who the fuck is he? He's just there saying yes to everything. So it's it's not well paced, and it doesn't really do much for the world design. Like with SMT three, with each ideology, like the atmosphere is very heavy on the game, and you feel that. As you play. SMT5, you don't really feel anything. You see the demons live amongst other demons in SMT3. You have They have hierarchies. They have gangs. They have they have all those like, networks and all this stuff that's going on. And in SMT5, the demons just kind of seem that they were just dropped, and, dropped on the map. And they were just like, yeah, we're here. The closest we get to a community is the Fury Village. The Fury Village is the only demon community that feels like a community. All these other other demons that you talk to, they don't really feel they, they have a community. The closest that they try to do that with is with the Black Frost and Dionysus side mission. That's the only... That and the um, Asparis and Liana side missions. Any other side missions just kind of seem there to be there. They have one with Lilum and... Um, it's not Dominion. It's uh, the blue guy with the trumpet, I think. And he's like, oh, we gotta get the Lilums, dude. They're fucking, they fu they're, they're fucking weird, dude. We gotta get them. And then you have the uh, mermaids, which are really cool. I like the mermaid side mission, too. But it, it still, like, feels very lacking compared to the other games. And, uh, well, to SMT3, where each demon actually feels like a community. It, it's some, it's a little bit in SMT5, sure. But I just don't think it's as much as it was in 3, where it just... Seems that these demons are just dropped on a map and they're just there, and I it just it's kind of it kind of is a it's kind of disappointing, and as I said before, like SMT five, it's it has a a promising potential with it. The other character that's very underutilized is Tao, and it's bullshit because they they straight up tell you that she had, that that she's like a priestess or some shit, and you're like wow that's like a very big deal. And then they kill her immediately. <laughs> like, you meet her, and she's like, yeah, I'm a priestess. I'm hot shit. They all have to protect me. All right. 
she comes along with you on a mission, and then she dies, and then that that's it of her until the end, and then she's like, oh, actually, I'm like a goddess. Hello, what's up, bitch? And it's like, okay, cool. And it just it's it's so lame that she's so underutilized. Uh, such an interesting character, and it's just she comes in and then she dies. The other character that has that same kind of issue is um. I can't remember his name, but you fight him with Tao, and he's, like, testing your skills or whatever. He's there, and then he just goes away, and you never have to think about him. He's so out of the way in the uh, final area that you could honestly just miss him. You could, you could get him into your party, but you really have to go out of your way to find him, to talk to him. And it's, it's like, this guy, like, goes out, he's talking shit to you, like, yeah, I'm gonna test your fucking shit, man. Okay, cool. You fucking beat his ass, and then you never see him again. He, there's no other rematch. There's no other like fucking thing unless you go out of your way for him. It's like, what? What's the point of this character? And it just... And I also question some of the decisions that make things optional. Like I don't, I still don't get why Kansu is an optional boss fight because he's one of the, he's one one of the people at the summit who openly says, well, who who starts all these demons to go against. Uh, Bethel or whatever the fuck, and he's optional. Like, why? <laughs> uh, so all these decisions that make some things optional, some not. I I don't I don't quite get. Sheva, I can understand being optional and why that would tie into the fourth ending, but not sparing K Kansu was not very clear. Like it was, it, I didn't have any inkling to think, oh, Kansu like is 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 important or whatever. So. The story is just kind of all over the place. It it, it really does feel, and, if, and it comes up in the game design, or the presentation of the game by the end, where it feels like that they were making this game in in a certain way, and then they're like, well, we can't fit, we can't fit another location. So let's just pour everything into this, into this area of the game, and cut everything, and then make this stuff optional, and all this kind of stuff, and pour that in, and make that like this, and make and cut some corners, and that's what it kind of feels like. Meanwhile, SMT three felt more complete, even though it, a lot of the added content or added content, like the labyrinth stuff, is at it was added to the game. This just seems like they cut stuff out, and all this stuff was just last minute, and it seemed rushed, and it just it affected the story negatively. I I just couldn't care about the story. Like I didn't like I didn't care for Bethel. I didn't like the. Uh, the idea of the story by the time you get to when you when it's revealed to you that Tokyo was fake, it's like I I don't know, I I really just did not feel as mu as much invested in this. It got to the point where in the middle of the game, usually when I play a game and I'm really invested in the story, I would keep playing it. I would keep getting it, it you know inklings to go back to it. I've gotten more of an inkling to go back to SMT three when I was streaming that game, like. The only reason to, the only reason why I was streaming that game on and off as mo as infrequent as I was it was just more it was different reasons that was not related to the game. It was like uh, I I want to do something else or whatever. But I still well, I was like I really want to play SMT three. Oh my god, I really want to keep playing it, etc. Well, with this, it's like I'm playing this on my own terms, and it's like okay, I played it. Uh, I don't I don't play this right now, and it it that's just kind of a bummer to it uh, for me. So. Overall, SMT5 is a solid game. I think it's good. I think if you're a fan of SMT or Persona, I think it's worth checking out. Uh, it doesn't feel like it's it's too short or anything. I think it's a solid game overall. The gameplay is fun. Uh, there's fun to be had, but the story is. I think I think the story is the weakest part of the game. It's easily the most forgettable part because smt3 was really fun to really think about the story and to talk about it like i was looking forward to doing a video on that but this it's like okay yeah yeah i'm gonna have to do a video eventually but you know i was more interested to see how this would stack up to three than than anything else and i got my answer three is far better uh I, it's just I can't say SMT5 is bad. I, I wouldn't tell you that. I wouldn't say it's a shitty game either. I think it's fun and solid. It's just the story is really the weakest part. I think if you're going in just for a JRPG, just to play on the Switch, 
you'll get that pretty well and i think i think that's it's a very solid game for that it has a lot of good good features that improve the experience of smt it does have some of its iconic challenge but it's nowhere near as hard as smt3 smt3 at least that one seemed more uh rewarding on a, on a skill level like on a very strategic level this one seems more of just like you can learn it pretty easily and then and then you could just carry on like once you start getting better miracles the easier the game is i do like the um the abscess mechanic like when you go to each abscess you have to fight these mini bosses i like i like that in the game the exploration is fun but it just that's kind of it the gameplay is the strongest point the weakest is the story so if you were to ask me what i would rate this game i'd probably give it a 7 out of 10 and that's kind of being generous but it is a solid game i think it is fun it is worth some of the praise it gets but i can't say it's it's my favorite game of 2021 like i've seen a lot of people say this was their game of the year and it's like i don't know if it would be mine i i kind of feel like it would like if it was between SMT three and five. I would probably go with SMT three being the game of the year, and that's just a remaster because that game at least is solid and fun, and it had a lot of stuff going for it. Well, this one just seems kind of like it's good, but it just falls short of what it could be. So that is it for this video. Thank you for watching this vid. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you uh, agreed or disagreed with what I had to say. There might be some stuff I forgot that I was supposed to mention, but it is what it is. Sometimes you can't win them all. But thank you for the support. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you next time for the next Game Club video, whatever it may be. It might be Persona 2, Resident Evil 4. I don't know. We will see. Thank you for watching. Hope to see you in the next one. Bye bye